So Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 1 to verse 5. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that you may that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Good morning, mom and dad. All right, so Paul, Paul once again, he's starting, you know, here we're here in, in uh, chapter two, and he's um, wants them to know the sincerity of his concern for them. He is concerned, as he is with most of the books that he writes. It's because he's writing out of an element of concern. There is stuff going on, and he's concerned. He, he's concerned that they're being led astray. He's concerned that they're getting off on the wrong path. Good morning, Pat. And so Paul's term here, struggle, is really it's the same kind of word for strive or agony. So he is struggling, he's striving, and he's agonizing over the church at Col uh, Colossae and Laodicea. In fact, by the way, another little small note, they, there are scholars who believe that this book was actually written first to the church of Laodicea, and then he changed that little bit to Colossae in order to send it to, Coloss or, you know, to Laodicea in this book. And so he kind of wrote two copies one that he put the name Colossae in, sent to Laodicea, and one that he sent the name Laodicea and sent it to Colossae. And, um, you know, we don't really know for sure. But uh, anyways, so because it's unusual that he would mention two cities in the same book, but they were pretty close to each other. And so the intent might have been that this would have been read at both, um, both churches. But anyways, so Paul is agonizing over them. He's He's striving. He is worried. He's concerned, and his concern is deep. His concern has given him a burden because he has a burden for their souls. He has a burden that they would stay on the right track, that they would learn proper faith and, and the Christian walk. So really, as I was kind of reading that, I was thinking, when was the last time we have been in deep agony? over someone's soul. Good morning, Ray. When was the last time you had a deep agony, were drawn or brought to near tears because of the agony and concern you had over someone's soul? When did you last pray with that sort of sincere concern and agony for someone? Often we see this type of thing from Paul, and you could almost say that prayer to be effective involves a form, a form of strain and agony. When you're praying for someone's healing, there is a strain, there is a concern, and there is an agony. When you are praying for someone's soul, you are praying with this deep level of concern and agony. The burden of his prayer was the strength and the unity that he wanted to see in the church. That they were to find unity in love, that love is cohesive, love bonds together. He wanted their compassion and he wanted their comprehension of God to continue to grow deeper and deeper. He wanted them to be able to discern from the distractions that were around them. They were there, there, there were those that were leading people astray. This gospel of Gnosticism was was uh, had not taken name yet, but was becoming more and more prevalent in their society, even this worship of angels. And Paul wished to shine light on the 
downfall of this belief, the outcome of their theology, if they were to continue to work it through. And he wanted to shine light on the truth that they would find discernment and be able to discern from the Holy Spirit the right way and the right path. He then goes on to describe kind of, if you will, the marks of a faithful church. You know, he's talked about the marks of a faithful believer. You know, that was the gentleness, humbleness, gentleness, uh, uh, self-control. You know, it was those those burdens for one another, carrying each other's loads. We, we've talked through those in other books. But here it's these marks of a faithful church. One is courage. The mark of a faithful church is courage. When pressured to cave, pressured by false teaching, Paul prays that they will be encouraged. And this comes from the assurance of their faith, the courage to cope with any situation. As a body of believers, we are called to courage in the midst of chaotic times. Courage, first and foremost, that spends more time speaking about the gospel of Christ than concern or worry about the chaos around us. I, I spoke uh, yesterday to a bunch of teachers and I initially had written this whole thing about teachers and we need to teach ourselves and, and uh, you know, and talking about the times and this year is going to be chaotic and it's going to be, you know, the um, most difficult year they've ever taught in. And I, I stood up there and when I went to speak, I had had them read some verses from Psalms 46 prior. And the pastor that read that, that passage took the time to actually say the word, Selah. Selah. It was a musical type term, like a rest, a break. And then Psalms 46, one of the most famous lines in there, and it's talking about God, our his faithfulness and our refuge. And we had just sung, Great is thy faithfulness. And the last one of the last verses is be still and know that I am God. And I got up there and I kind of threw my notes out. And I even told him that I said, I, I really feel uh, led and compelled, I was going to get up here and tell you everything you already knew. And sometimes as a pastor, it's easy to get up and just want to tell people everything they know. But there's no courage to ask them or seek to grow for them to go deeper and to serve more or to be more and grow more in Christ. And there's a sense of comfort in just preaching what we already know. There's a sense of comfort in just pointing out what the news has already told us and being so caught up and speaking on that if I if I needed to or wanted to, instead of calling people to peace. It's a countercultural thought right now. Faith in Christ, trust in him that leads us to peace in the midst of a storm faith and trust. There's courage, courage to cope with situations, which then leads out into our individual's lives when suffering comes our way, when a hardship comes our way, when a diagnosis comes our way, we are able to find courage because great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. <laughs> there is no shadow of turning with thee, Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Second mark that he points out is the mark then of your unity. You know, from courage to, to unity, it knits us. Unity knits us together in special love. So patterns, the modes of the church, they're going to vary from church to church, you can go to this church and another one. Good morning, Jennifer. And, and the modes are going to change, but we can be unified in the doctrines. Preferences will change, but we can be unified as believers. Because we should be known by our love. Our love for one another. The love for the world around us. Not conformity to the world around us, but love. 
1 John 4, 7. It's a great verse on that. They will know. They're great songs, right? They will know that we are Christians by our love. By our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Love makes us one. Even in the midst of differences. Love unifies. Which is courage. Love. And God is love. The third mark of a church, of a faithful church, is wisdom. Wisdom. Multifaceted knowledge. Paul uses three different words here when he talks about the wisdom. First is this idea of, the, the, the Greek word is sinesis, which is understanding carefully assessing, and this is different ways that Paul uses wisdom, it's, it's understanding, carefully assessing a situation and determining the best action to take. That's an understanding. He, he also uses the word gnosis, which again is where Gnosticism came from, because it was this belief that they had a secret knowledge and only they could share it with people. Um, it's a secret society. It's, you know, all of that. It's, it was false. It was a heresy, but the word came from this Greek word gnosis, which meant knowledge. It meant the ability to learn and to grasp info. So you have understanding and you have knowledge, and then you have Sophia, wisdom. Sophia. It's the ability to probe, to confirm, to convey truth to others. By reasonable argument, reasonable argument, not, not, you remember I've talked about apologetics and how I love apologetics. I, I love, I mean, I just today I was reading a, uh, a book from the third century by, or fourth century, um, Pseudo uh, Marcarius was the author because it's not really the right guy. It was somebody else. And so they call it Pseudo because it was in his name, but it was 50 homilies. And it's kind of like a catechism. It's a, it's a, deeper dive seeking to understand how the early fathers looked at some of these main core beliefs. And there's 50 homilies that they had written, kind of like what ended up becoming the catechism or the shorter catechism that, you know, Westminster, Westminster catechism. But it's the ability in that to probe, not just to share something that you see on Facebook because um, you know, it's so easy. We, we see so much misinformation nowadays. We have to be careful in that misinformation. But to probe and to confirm. How many times I've seen people share things from a good example, the Babylon Bee, which is a satire. It's kind of like the onion. It, it's a satire. It's not true. <laughs> it's satire. And yet they share it thinking it's true. We're to probe. We're to confirm. And then we are to convey truth. But to do it in a reasonable manner, in a manner that doesn't browbeat. That's the downfall of apologetics that's taken to the wrong stand. It's to prove that I'm right, but to prove that we love. Wisdom must come on the back of love and courage. You've got to have courage to share wisdom and to convey these truths, but you do it on the backs of love and courage. So wisdom on love, on courage, and then the next one that kind of just builds on that is this idea of resistance. It's protecting the key truths of the gospel. It's protecting the key truths of the gospel. It's resisting all things that are false. It's recognizing and resisting falsehoods that truth received and truth understood and you hold that tightly. You hold on to that tightly. You defend God the Father. You defend what God has done in your life. But you do it with wisdom, with love, and with courage. The fifth order, fifth item that he kind of gives as a mark of a church is discipline. Discipline. It's order. It's 
firm faith. Those were those were military terms that he uses there to describe this. He uses it in verse five that you know to see your good order and the firmness of your faith. They're military terms. You know when he's describing order. Order was this taxis and uh, Greek word taxis, and it's this idea of rank, rank and file. So you could just imagine um, Hitler propaganda uh, films. You know of the. German army marching in sync, step, step by step by step. That's order. Or if you've ever been to the tomb of the unknown soldier and the order by which that soldier marches and stops, turns, stops, marches. I mean, there's an order to it. Do you know that in those regiments of soldiers for the un, uh, unknown soldiers, the tomb of the unknown soldier, that they are all within a short, small variance? So each group will be within the same variance of height, give or take only just a little bit. That way their gates are the same. That way their steps are the same. That way there is an order to what they do. Or to be a trained army, if you will, of believers. Not an army that goes out to attack. Okay, that's that's too often the the usage when when we used to use terms like I'm in God's army or the Christian soldiers, onward Christian soldiers. We even used words like and and, and I, I grew up singing that song, but I have a little bit of a problem with singing onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. Now, who's the war against? Now, we would all say we wrestle not against this world, but against flesh, you know, flesh and blood, but powers. So it's against Satan. Yes, we are in a war against Satan, and we can go out as onward Christian soldiers, but too often we turned into the holiness legalism that we were at war against the world, and anybody who didn't agree with us was our enemy. And that breaks my heart. Because they aren't our enemies. It's Satan who is our enemy. And we need to see Satan behind each and every broken, lost individual. So we're to be trained and sent out. Trained, discipled, and deployed to make a difference. He uses that word firm, which is a word stereoama stereoama and it's a solid front so it gives the picture of the army that even as the onward army is is coming towards them they are standing their ground firm not wavering solid and we only stand firm in spiritual strength because it comes in christ it's the second seventh mark is in Christ, in Christ, life in Christ through the Spirit. That's how we are to live. That is our firm foundation, in Christ. We are to be in Christ in everything we do, in Christ. Sorry, that's the sixth mark. The seventh mark is apostolic. Apostolic. So there, this term apostolic, sometimes, if, you know, we can equate that with the denomination. There's apostolic churches, which are very um, Pentecostal. Um, you know, women can't cut their hair, can't wear jewelries. You aren't saved unless you speak in tongues. Um, a good friend that is a apostolic minister. Um, but apostolic in this term is more like the apostles. It is the willingness to do something new. Apostolic, in the form of the Ephesians, Apest model, apostolic was someone who started new ministries, someone who went in and maybe planted a new church, somebody who went into something that was older or dying and was willing to revitalize it and bring something new out of it. Something who, someone who came into a time and changed things, willing to do new things to follow God's agenda, not stuck 
in preference, not stuck in personal, willing to try new things because modes and practice change. Modes and practice change. I'll tell you the churches that are the most apostolic right now during COVID were the first ones to jump on the online bandwagon. They were the first ones to have house churches. They were the first ones to, to be able to come up with ways to still minister, to use things like uh, our, our, the tool that we threw out there, the Bless Every uh, Home, where uh, we had people praying over their neighbors and got to know their neighbors' names. These are all keys that we need. And there's more. I, I don't know what they are. I don't know what the next step is, but those that are apostolic are jumping on that and are coming up with new ways. In, in apostolic, too, you're willing to try new things. Do you realize not all new things work? You're willing to try. Because if it can save one, then you're willing to try new things. You're willing to try anything and everything in order to reach one, to grow one. And then the eighth mark that he points out is this idea of overflowing gratitude. Overflowing gratitude. Faith overflows with thanksgiving. Does your faith overflow with thanksgiving to God? Does a song ever be? May his praise, is his praise ever on your lips? Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will we are to be rooted. We are to be built up. We are to be established. We are to be abounding. Those should be the descriptions of the church. But too often the church, instead of rooted, <laughs> rooted would be turned into a negative terms. They're rooted into their own preference and rooted into the way they've always done things. They are built up walls to keep non-believers out because, well, it's messy. They have built up walls. They have been established in the way they've always done it. I was talking with somebody, and this is for those of us in my church. Um, I was speaking to a neighbor, a neighbor that doesn't attend our church, a neighbor who grew up in our church. Um, and I won't say more because it gives too much away, but it was somebody here uh, in our community who grew up in this church, in the Nazarene Church, and their statement of the church was that in their growing up, and he's, you know, they're right around my age, um, so in their 30s, 40s, this church was known as the formal church in town. The church where, kind of like that real fancy restaurant, that if you didn't come in in a suit and tie, you were looked down on. Now, that's their perception. I'm not saying that that's right. I don't know. I wasn't here. But they never felt welcome. They felt like they faked who they were by dressing up. Sometimes we get established in the wrong things. And instead of being known in our community for our love, which we're changing, <laughs> which this church in the last seven years, decade, has done so much better at, and it's still growing by God's strength. As we wake up to God's agenda, as we talked about that definition of revival last this past Sunday, but as we wake up to the God's agenda, we are beginning to change what we're established on. It doesn't mean that we change our beliefs, we change anything else. There's still staples of who we are. I told the board there's five key things. There's preaching the word, Sunday service. There's our worship, our kids, our youth, and missions. That's what we're to be known for. That's where we'll grow. Discipleship goes right in there with the Sunday because discipleship, Sunday school, all of that is so important. It's a part of who we are. 
but we must be careful that we're also at the same time abounding. We're willing to try new things. We're willing to fail once in a while. We're willing to have a ministry that goes on for generations as well. It's okay. It doesn't mean you scrap all the old to start new. No. It's a both and. We're called to overflowing gratitude. Well, let's start from the beginning. We're called to courage, to unity, to wisdom, to resistance, to discipline, to be in Christ, to be willing to try new things at apostolic, and to be overflowing in gratitude for God. That's what the marks of the church are to be, the marks of the body of the Christ of Christ and the marks of a church building. An individual known or a group known as Jefferson Church of the Nazarene or whatever church you worship at. We are called to those marks. But we do it by God's guidance. We do it by being, do I use a, a, a youth term, woke <laughs> to God's agenda. To be awakened to God's agenda in our lives, in our community, in our county, and in our world. That's what we're called to do. So Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask that you continue to grow us as believers, as the body of Christ, so that our local churches might be empowered to grow. To grow not with transfer growth, but to grow with new growth. Individuals who are coming to know you, God, who are far from you, may we be a church where they feel welcome. May we be a church where they feel cared for, loved. May we have the courage to speak, the wisdom and the knowledge to know how to convey truth accurately to do so with love and wisdom. Because God, we're representing you. While I am an ordained minister, ordained in, in the Wesleyan holiness background, uh, my preaching, while it does represent those that denomination, it also, though, represents you, God. And Lord, as believers, our lives, as the body of Christ, we are ambassadors. An ambassador isn't somebody who sits and waits for people to come to them. That's a tour guide. God, I don't want to be a tour guide. I want to be an ambassador. I want to be one that goes out and as I am going to make disciples, teaching them. And as we go, God, may we give you all the glory because we don't go in our knowledge. We don't go in our strength, but we go in yours. So, Lord, continue to transform us inwardly so that we're different outwardly and corporately. May we be a church that continues to deliver the word, disciple the believer, and deploy the church for your glory, for your sake. Wake us up to your agenda, God. Give us a holy discontent until we're willing to come into order as you call us to. In the name of your Son, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask these things. Amen. 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 We'll go in peace and uh, hope you have a good rest of the day.